This is Breakthroughs, a podcast from Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine. I'm Erin Spain, Communications Director at Feinberg. Recent studies suggest that half of the U.S. adult population will be obese in less than 10 years. Right now, aside from diet and lifestyle interventions, bariatric surgery is the only proven method of achieving long-term weight loss for people with obesity. But that could change. The drug, semaglutide, typically prescribed for treatment of type 2 diabetes, was used in a phase 3 clinical trial with very promising results. Feinberg's Dr. Robert Kushner led this study, recently published in the New England Journal of Medicine. Dr. Kushner is a weight management expert and professor of medicine in the Division of Endocrinology and professor of medical education here at Northwestern. Thank you so much for joining me today to talk about this study. Thank you, Erin. It's a pleasure to be here. What is the latest on the obesity epidemic in America and around the world? What are you seeing? Well, according to the latest CDC information, approximately 42% of adults in America uh, have obesity. And if you add overweight to that, now you're up to three out of four uh, adults in America. It's also rising across the country. We, we are at the epicenter uh, of populations uh, that are suffering from obesity. I can tell you it's not getting better. Uh, it's only getting worse. You lead a team at the Northwestern Medicine Center for Lifestyle Medicine. Um, what treatments are currently available for people with obesity and what is the most effective and how important is it to be investigating new treatments? The, the Center for Lifestyle Medicine uh, at Northwestern Medicine is an interprofessional team approach to help people manage their weight. So we have medical providers, we have registered dietitians, we have health psychologists, and we also work side by side with the Bariatric Surgery Center. We use a medical model for the treatment of obesity, which we consider a chronic relapsing disease like diabetes or hypertension. What a medical model is, uh, is starting with the foundation of lifestyle treatment, which is diet, physical activity, sleep hygiene, uh, positive behaviors, mindset, and so forth. And then for those that need more aggressive treatment, we'll use modalities such as medication or pharmacotherapy, and then also bariatric surgery. So each person is looked at individually, and we decide upon a treatment course that best fits their lifestyle and their risk factors. This idea that we need to be looking for new treatments all the time, why is that so important? Obesity is very difficult to treat. I could tell you it's, it's more effective to prevent obesity than to currently treat it. And the reason is that it's, it's multifactorial. There are many causes why one weighs what they weigh, starting with genetics and biology, you know, we all, we're all familiar with the fact that our hair color, eye color, skin color, um, our risk for medical problems is often genetically determined, right? We look at our family history and we tend to look like and act like our siblings or our parents. Obesity is no different. Uh, if you come from a family of individuals who are suffering from their weight, uh, you, are, you have a higher risk of developing obesity yourself. So it, it's hardwired in a lot of us. And on top of that, it's how we live our lives, the decisions we make, the life events that we undergo. Uh, Some medications we take can be a weight gaining. So there's so many factors that lead into what we weigh. It's very, very difficult to treat. And I think anyone who suffers from having obesity uh, will often say, you know, I can lose weight. It's keeping the weight off is where I struggle. Uh, And that's where we spend a lot of our time working with our patients. You mentioned in the first question uh, that it's not getting any better, the obesity epidemic. What's been happening during this COVID-19 pandemic as well? Have you seen more people, less people coming through your doors for treatment? This is important because obesity, there are some implications there if people have COVID-19 and they uh, have obesity as well. You're you're right, Erin. Uh, obesity is a listed risk factor on the CDC website for uh, having complications from COVID-19. Um, it is the first time we've ever seen an acute problem shine light on obesity. You know, we always think of obesity as a chronic problem with lifelong problems. This is the first time in my 40-year career that obesity has been a risk factor for an acute problem, which is an infectious uh, disease. Now, how, how people have responded to the pandemic, which is a year old almost, uh, has been a mixed bag. 
I think most people are struggling uh, from social isolation, uh, depression, having food around all the time, having gyms closed. And all of these factors conspire to put body weight on. And I think that's the majority of, of individuals, probably around the world. However, in our own practice at the Center for Lifestyle Medicine, we've also seen individuals who have thrived actually in the pandemic regarding their body weight. And these are folks who, who were susceptible to eating on the run, traveling a lot, eating in airports, not having enough time to spend on themselves. So the fact that they have been homebound now, they have taken uh, that opportunity to take better care of themselves, learn to cook, eat healthy, have their home a safe haven, uh, use uh, websites or virtual uh, media to get in physical activity, use exercise bands and so forth, get a good night's sleep. And they've actually done well. But the majority, Aaron, I think have not done as well for the reasons we already talked about. Well, there is some promising news. So let's talk about this drug, semaglutide, that was used in this landmark study you led recently published in the New England Journal of Medicine. Tell me about this drug. How does it work? I use the word game changer in a lot of the interviews that I've been doing. And, and, that's, and that's really how I look at it. Uh, it, it's the first time that we have seen this magnitude of weight loss uh, compared to currently uh, medications on the market for obesity. It's one and a half to two times more effective than currently available drugs we have on the market. Now, how the drug works, semaglutide mimics a gut hormone called a GLP-1 or glucagon-like one peptide. Uh, and this naturally occurring hormone in the body. And this hormone is responsible for helping us end a meal. When we all eat, uh, at some point, we're no longer hungry. We start feeling full uh, or satiated and we stop eating. So there's a lot of factors that lead to helping us feel full. Uh, GLP-1 is one of those hormones that does it. Semaglutide is a, a, a mimic uh, or it's an analog, it's a lookalike of this gut hormone. So the Novo Nordisk manufacturer was able to develop a, a compound that acts like our naturally occurring GLP-1. So when we give it, uh, it tends to slow stomach emptying. So we get a little more full in the belly and the receptors in the stomach stretch. So we start feeling full. But the main effect of the drug is because there's receptors for this hormone in the brain, in the appetite center and the reward center. So when we take the medication, our brain starts sensing that you're full, you're less hungry, in many people, less thoughts about food and more contentment between meals. And that's what leads to weight loss. Individuals eat less food, they reduce their calories, and they're content doing that. How is this different from other drugs that have been brought to market for obesity? It's about one and a half to two times more successful or more effective than those drugs. And those drugs work through different mechanisms. They, 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 all, every, all of them except Orlistat, which, which is a fat blocker, trade name is Ally, which, is a, which you could purchase over the counter. Uh, but other than that one, which fat blocks the, the amount of, of fat in our intestine, all the other drugs do work up in the appetite center of the brain uh, through different signaling mechanisms uh, that make us feel full or reduced hunger. The difference is they're not as effective as semaglutide. How was the drug used in this phase three clinical trial? And you already mentioned some of the results, but tell me a little bit about the trial and how it worked. So the trial was conducted at 129 sites in 16 countries. So this really was a global study. And one of the center uh, sites was here at Northwestern. Uh, individuals uh, who, who wanted to participate in the research study were randomized by a flip of the coin to either taking the medication or taking what's called a placebo. And, and, the, and the subjects and the investigators did not know uh, which uh, one the individual or participant was getting. The way the medication is given is by a weekly injection. Uh, it starts at a low dose and it takes about a month to slowly escalate the dose to the full dose. And then it is given once a week uh, for 68 weeks. That's how long the trial lasted, so a little bit over a year. All participants, you got the study drug or placebo, uh, met with a registered dietitian on a monthly basis uh, to receive guidance on how to eat healthy, uh, how to be more physically active, uh, and how to strategize to take better care of yourself. So it was grounded in a healthy uh, lifestyle program. Uh, and the primary outcome of the study was weight loss. Other outcomes, which are, of course, equally important in someone who's struggling with their weight and has illnesses, 
is what is the effect on blood pressure, blood fats, uh, blood sugar control, inflammation markers, as well as quality of life measurements. So that's how the study was conducted, and it ran for 68 weeks. Did people do the injection themselves, or were they coming in to the study center site to receive it? Uh, the injections were self-administered. Um, any, anyone who has diabetes or has um, uh, illnesses where you're using injection, like inflammatory bowel disease, rheumatoid arthritis, or psoriasis, these are, these are called biologics, and they're probably familiar with giving yourself an injection, typically with a pen right under the skin. And, and that's how this was given. Currently available diabetes drugs are often given this way uh, through an injectable pen. So objects were, were trained on how to do it within the first one or two weeks. And the rest of the time, they gave themselves an injection once a week at home. What did study participants who actually received the drug, what did they have to say about their results? You know, directly what they said uh, by, the, by the patient reported outcomes um, because we looked at we looked particularly at physical functioning using uh, different uh, surveys, such as are you able to walk faster? Are you able to climb a flight of stairs? Are you feeling better? Uh, and everyone on uh, the majority of individuals who took the injection did feel better, had an improved functional score. Now they did have side effects as well, uh, which need, need to be highlighted. Uh, the most common side effects from a drug like this are gastrointestinal things like nausea, diarrhea, some people had vomiting uh, and constipation. Uh, in general, they were mild to moderate, they were transient, so they were short acting and they tended to go away. I think an interesting uh, point about the side effects is only 7% of individuals on the study drug uh, had a dropout, which means they just could not tolerate the side effects of the medication. In contrast, 93 out of 100, or you know, 93% were able to stay in the trial uh, and did very well. well. That's good news. There were, there were also some limitations in this study. Describe those. From my point of view, uh, some of the biggest limitations are we, we were unable to recruit uh, as a diverse uh, population of individuals as we would like. So for example, three, three quarters of the participants were women and three quarters of the participants uh, were Caucasians, whites. So we would want to study this medication in a much more diverse population, more men, uh, as well as uh, more individuals like Blacks, uh, Hispanic individuals, Asian individuals, and so forth. I guess you can consider another potential limitation is that it ended at 68 weeks. And I think everyone wants to know is is the drug had a, had a really fabulous outcome. I, I'd mentioned a third of individuals lost over 20% of their body weight, which is just spectacular. But you know what happens when you stop the medication? And, and that is an ongoing observation. A, a, a portion of the study individuals are in a follow-up study in which we're going to follow them up for one year. Okay. Have there been anything that you've uh, could share right now that's happened so far with those individuals who are in the follow-up study? No, that, that won't be. The, the, the study ended uh, about a year ago, uh, a little less than that. So these individuals will be followed for one year. So th those results are not available right now. Maybe by this summer, we'll learn more about its use and could it be used? Would it be used in centers like your center at Northwestern Medicine? How would people be able to access this drug? Well, the drug is 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 not approved by the FDA yet. It was submitted uh, for application in December 2020. Uh, and by FDA standards, it takes about six months for the FDA uh, review process to go forward. I think we're going to be hearing more about this medication. I know there's been some previous studies for non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. It looks like there's other diseases that some phase three clinical trials will be launching soon. Uh, do you think this is going to become more of a household name, uh, semaglutide? Now, that's a great question, Erin. Uh, and from my point of view, as a uh, not only clinical researcher, but by uh, director of the Center for Lifestyle Medicine, I'm very involved in how do we educate and empower our primary care providers to uh, work with patients, their patients, to guide them in managing their weight and providing a range of services. This medication, if and hopefully it'll be approved uh, sometime this summer, the next hurdle is how do we get the medication in the hands of providers so that they can provide the, uh, meet the needs of their patients? There are too many individuals who are struggling with their weight to stand in line to go to a specialized center like mine. I would envision 
that when we have a tool that is this powerful, this medication, it could be available in the primary care office, working with your own physician and perhaps a referral to a registered dietitian. So they can provide the care that we know is going to be so helpful. And it sounds like it's coming along at just the right time as these numbers continue to rise and we see more and more people uh, with obesity. First of all, the medication uh, will be investigated uh, in different patient populations, like I said, hopefully a greater diverse population, but also uh, in other disease categories. Uh, individuals who are suffering from knee arthritis, what's the effect of weight loss? Individuals with sleep apnea, you know, the weight loss helps that. Um, fatty liver disease, you mentioned, congestive heart failure. There's all kinds of, of disease uh, categories that this may be helpful. Also teens, it hasn't been studied uh, in children. Um, so that, that's something we're, we're hoping to do. A um, lot of us in, this, in the obesity space uh, have talked about this as, as a potential anchor drug for obesity. Now that's yes to be tested, but uh, this drug being so successful uh, beyond any of the other drugs we have, I would envision that this will become the drug of choice to start treatment with if, if it's appropriate for the person and they can tolerate it and then potentially add it to other drugs as well. But this, this drug is so effective, I'm hoping it's gonna change the landscape of, of when we treat individuals with obesity and how we treat individuals with obesity who are having health complications. Uh, individuals are, are struggling to manage their weight they're frustrated uh, that they their difficulty not only losing weight, but as I said before, difficulty keeping their weight off. And they're looking for help and they're looking for resources. So the more tools we can put in our toolbox, um, how to guide them on healthy eating, uh, being more physically active, uh, having the mindset uh, around uh, being healthy and, and sustaining those behaviors, and if needed, having effective tools to uh, escalate that treatment to things like pharmacotherapy. And you mentioned earlier, bariatric surgery. These are all the modalities that we have available to help people uh, who have obesity uh, and health problems related to it. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Robert Kushner, for sharing all this information. And we uh, hope to have you back in the future, perhaps once this is being used by patients in your clinic. Uh, thank you. And, and I would also encourage all the listeners, if you want a variety of resources uh, to learn about obesity, as well as to take a quiz to learn more about yourself and what to work on, I would encourage you to visit www.drrobertkushner.com. You can head to feinberg.northwestern.edu to listen to past episodes of the show and claim CME credit for listening to this episode. Be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever you download your podcasts so you never miss an episode. Thanks for listening.